Knowing how to apply shading to your drawings will help you to take the dimensionality and realism of them to a completely new level. After watching this tutorial, with a bit of practice, you'll be able to convincingly shade your drawings in no time. Shading is creating the illusion of depth by applying different values, like shades of grey, to certain areas of your sketch. Using contrasting values is key in describing volumes and how objects sit in their surroundings. And that's mainly what we'll be focusing on today, but it's worth noting that that's not all they're good for. Values can help the viewer decide where to look at, what's important about the image. They can even affect how the image makes you feel, what the atmosphere is like, or how far away things are. Ultimately, value in drawings represents light and the lack of light, which is exactly what we're seeing around us all the time. Everything you see, you see as a range of values. Well, also color, but even colors have value. And this is why it's so important to learn how to produce and how to place those values into your visuals. As usual, there are at least as many ways to create values as there are drawing tools, all with their own individual trades. But whatever technique you like to use, you should be able to produce a good range of values with enough contrast for them to stand out from each other. There are special drawing tools that are made specifically for these things, but you might be surprised by what can be achieved with just a humble ballpoint pen. The amount of different values you need merely depends on what you're drawing, but let's say 5 is a good amount to start with. The lightest value can simply be as light as your paper, and the darkest shadow can be as dark as you can make it with your drawing tool. Then just fill the remaining values step by step. The narrower the value range, the easier they are to manage, which can be helpful if you're just starting out. Again, just make sure you have enough contrast between each value. Now, let me walk you through a very basic method of shading. In the previous video I drew this milk carton to explain line weights and contour lines. I'll just keep using it as an example here. We'll start out by defining the main light source, or rather a direction in which it lights up the carton. I say primary because there's always ambient light that hits the surfaces on the shadow sides as well, but that's a whole nother topic. For now, we need to start looking at this form as a set of planes, each facing in different directions. In this case, the one that would catch the most of our light source is this one here, so I'll just mark that one as number one. The second most light would be caught by this one up here, and as it's facing the same direction as the front most plane over here, their values should be the same, or at least very close. Then I'll just mark the rest of the planes based on how much light they should reflect. Now we know that we'll need five different values to shade this object. Let me just figure those out up here. Okay, now that we've settled on a value range, all that's left is to apply them to those planes we just numbered. Shading with uniform color fills like this gives you the effect of dimensionality and lighting, but if you're looking to achieve a bit more realism, using more dynamic tools can help with that. If you're shading by hatching, for example, you might as well follow the contour of your planes to emphasize the direction of any surface. This becomes even more important when shading curved planes or depicting textures. You can see techniques like this used in printed materials like banknotes, which are made by pressing pigment with metal plates on a piece of paper. Even Rembrandt used similar methods in its etchings from the 17th century.
Another important skill is being able to blend values into each other. When shading curved surfaces and round organic forms, applying gradients like this becomes essential. Imagine a sphere was lit from the side like this. Our main light source would reach its surface up to a certain point until it reaches this threshold, where it stops lighting up the surface. This shadow line, or terminator, is where the surface of the sphere starts to curve away, and the surface stops reflecting any direct light from this source into our eyes. It becomes the transition zone between light and shadow. This is sometimes referred to as core shadow, and it's where shading appears at its darkest on round surfaces. This is because in the real world, there are almost always secondary light sources, or at least some bounced light reflected from other surfaces around the object that would somewhat light up the shadow side of our object here as well. If we were to pull the light source towards the front, towards us, the shadow line would shift from the center to the right, as we'd see more of the front of the surface being lit, and conform to the ball shape, creating this blurred crescent-shaped shadow. If we move up the light source, the shadow moves to the opposite side accordingly, and so on. You can probably start to see how this works. I'm going to use this sketch of a pear to demonstrate how you can apply this to less regular forms. Let's set the light source to the top left again, and start by defining the shadow line. Knowing contour lines, something I also talked about in part 4 of the series, can be helpful in wrapping your head around this. Trying to visualize which areas would catch the most light can be helpful as well. In this case, the shadow line would look something like this. You can see how the curve is somewhat of a squished version of the profile. And this doesn't have to be exact in any way. Especially organic forms like this are very forgiving in terms of getting shading to look right. You might want to finish the shading by adding a highlight, a reflection of the light source on the surface. Also, getting rid of your sketch lines can help in realism if that's what you're after. Applying shading methodically like this is one thing, and it really helps in understanding what's going on, but a lot of times shading doesn't have to be exact by any means. Sometimes just adding a little splash of value in the right place will lift your sketch off the paper and make things much more convincing and interesting to look at. Just suggesting a slight value change like this will add a lot of dimension even to small thumbnail sketches. As usual, the best place to practice how to shade things you'd like to draw is by drawing from reference. Try to tune your eyes to look at core shadows as abstract shapes and simplify them. You may find that images with a strong light source and high contrast between light and shadow will make it easier to recognize those shapes. When drawing things with more complex shape shadows, it helps to break the whole composition down into simplified forms first, and then start adding in the line work and shading. Once again, proportions are very important here, and you can learn a lot about composition by studying light and shadow. After all, value contrasts play a significant role as a graphic element in your drawings. You could even go as far as limiting yourself to just two values, and really treat areas as either light or shadow. Try different mediums on colored papers. Try applying the areas of light to a dark paper instead. These are all surprisingly forgiving techniques, and they allow you to move fast, which is always good. So, the shading within an item is defined by the direction of its key light source, but objects also block light from reaching areas around them, creating what are called cast shadows. Cast shadows 
are great for tying your objects in with their surroundings. Cast shadows can be used to describe the space around your object, whether it's lighting, contour, or the distance between your object and the surrounding surfaces. I'm going to walk you through the basic principle of how to create one by using this box as an example. Let's say this cardboard box is just lying on the street. It's dark and there's a street light shining upon it over here. The thing we want to find out is what kind of a shadow would this box cast onto the street in this lighting scenario. In order to define an exact shape of the cast shadow, we're gonna have to pay attention to these three corners that are furthest away from the light source. We're going to start by defining the angle of the light source by drawing straight lines, all starting from the light source through each corner of the top of the box and beyond to the ground behind it. Then we'll define the direction of the shadow by drawing lines starting from the ground level directly under the light source and through the points that are directly under the top corners of our box here. In this case, the corners of the bottom of the box, like so. Now what's left to do is find the points where the lines we just drew cross and connect them, and we're left with the outline of our cast shadow. Notice that in some cases, depending on the angle of your object, you might have to locate one of the hidden corners of the box as well in order to define the direction of the drop shadow. The lower the light source, the longer the shadow becomes and vice versa. Next time you're outside on a sunny evening, pay attention to this and you'll notice the elongated shadows of things as the angle of the sun slopes down. When drawing shadows cast by natural light, these lines become practically perpendicular as the light source is so far away. Whereas the closer the light source is to the object, the more distorted the cast shadow becomes. The simple way to study these things in practice is to simply grab a flashlight or something and try how moving the light source around an object affects things. Keep observing your surroundings and it'll help you in building a good intuition for drawing them. Using the help of guidelines is just to give you the base knowledge of how this works. Just like you don't have to rely on perspective lines in order to achieve volumes that look convincing, for most purposes you can get away with simply estimating where the cast shadow would land. This is true especially with round objects. With digital tools, you can make convincing cast shadows very effectively by simply duplicating and distorting the silhouette of an object. Alright, for those of you who would like to start shading things right away, I've once again prepared a practice sheet to get you going. This one has a bunch of forms on which you can practice shading, and a set of photos that are a great shading reference. You can find the download link in the description. If you're new to this channel, this was the fifth episode of our free Learn to Draw series, so make sure to check out the previous episodes as well. Subscribe, leave a comment, and I'll talk to you in the next one. Bye.